Today we're going to talk about the radial arm saw. I want to tell you what this tool is capable of, as well as giving you some tips and tricks on how to use it safely. The radial arm saw was invented in the 1920s, and at that time it was called the Wonder Worker because of the variety of cuts that it can perform, and also because it can do many other non-cutting operations. It was once uh, a common tool that you'd find in almost every wood, wood shop, um, and it had a good 70 year run. It was popular up, it was popular up until probably the mid 1990s. Today it's generally fallen out of favor and it's been replaced by several other tools. And you won't find any of the common tool brands carrying a radial arm saw in their lineups anymore. Today, if you'd like to buy one of these new, you have to, you have to look at the uh, specialty tools or the industrial tools and any of the new ones worth owning start out at about $4,500. However, you can probably pick up a used one similar to this for $100 or $150. And it, in my opinion, even though this tool's pretty much disappeared from the consumer market, it's still worth owning uh, because there isn't any other tool with as much versatility. And considering that much versatility, it takes up a pretty small footprint. The radial arm saw is a, is a blade and a motor hung from an arm. The radial arm saw is capable of performing six different types of cuts. In the configuration I have this saw in right now, it allows you to do a straight cross cut. If I rotate the arm, I'm able to do a miter cut. If I rotate the blade, I can do a bevel cut. And if I rotate the arm and the blade, I'm able to do a compound cut. So in addition to those four cross cuts, this saw is also capable of doing rip cuts. You can rotate the motor and blade to the in-rip position and feed your wood in this way for a rip cut, or you can rotate it to the out-rip position and feed your wood in this way. And in both ripping positions, the saw blade can be rotated to allow the user to perform beveled rip cuts. So in addition to the six types of cuts this saw can perform, it can also perform additional operations. Two of those operations are dadoing and molding. Here you see a vintage 1982 7-inch adjustable dado blade, a molding guard, and a molding set. Notice on the right side of the motor there's a little red cap. That cap is a cover on an accessory power shaft which allows this tool to perform routing, carving, sanding, and drilling operations. Also there's attachments for this saw that allow it to do buffing and polishing. Notice it shows us here that the saw blade, the bottom of the saw blade, spins away from the operator. I brought out my handheld circular saw, which I prefer to call a skill saw, so that we can compa compare the blade rotation on this to the radial arm saw. We learned a minute ago that the blade rotates on the radial arm saw in this direction. If we look at the skill saw, it rotates in the exact same direction. Now here's what's interesting. When we saw with a skill saw, we always push it away from us with the blade turning this way. When we saw with a radial arm saw in the cross cut position like we have it here, we pull the saw towards us with the blade spinning this way. Could you imagine ever taking your skill saw and pulling it towards you with the blade spinning this way? 
you'd never do that. There's a reason, though, why you do cross cuts with the blade spinning this way and you pull the saw towards you. The main reason is, as you saw your piece, the direction of thrust on the workpiece is into the table and into the fence. And as an added bonus, most of the sawdust chips and waste are directed away from you. There's a safety concern with doing pull through cuts. And that concern is, is that the blade has a tendency to naturally, spinning this way, run towards the user. Let me demonstrate. Here I've got the blade just barely touching the table. If I reach in here and spin it in the same rotation that it spins when the motor's on, you see that as it grabs, it runs towards the user. This saw spins at 3,450 revolutions per minute. And if you're doing a pull-through cut, and it tries to climb up on the wood, or it grabs into the wood or the table that you're cutting, you got to be ready for it to run back towards you, to be propelled towards you. Likewise, if you let go of this handle while the saw is turned on, it can propel itself out. As such, you never want to have your hands anywhere near the direction this blade travels, the path this, this blade travels. When the saw is turned on, in any of the crosscut positions, one hand should be on the handle, the other should be holding down the workpiece. Or if the workpiece is clamped, the hand should be on the side of the table or in a safety zone. The free hand that's not holding the handle should always be at least six inches from the blade. And you should never cross your arms as you pull the saw through. Also, keep your work area clean, both the tabletop and the floor, especially because you do not want to fall into the saw if you trip. This saw blade is set to cut 1 32nd of an inch into the front table. But when it's behind the fence, it has a, a, at least 3 quarters of an inch of clearance. And this is exactly what we want because we don't want anything back there for that saw to grab onto if there was something for it to grab onto back there, or if it was sitting right on the table, and we turned the saw on, it could self-propel. This height difference between the rear table and the front table is a result of the front table having a table protector attached to it. The table protector is so that when you cut, you're not cutting into your regular table, but you're just cutting into a protector, which can be taken off and replaced once it gets too scarred up. But it also creates that safety zone where this back table is lower than the front table, not giving the saw anything to grab onto when it's parked back here in the safety zone. Our attention now to ripping wood on the radial long saw and discover what could go wrong there and how to do it safely. First of all, this saw has two rip positions. It has, if you rotate it to the right, that is called an out rip position, and you feed your work in this way. If you rotate it to the left, that is called the in rip position. Let me show you also here on the saw itself, it's labeled, it says blade in rip. And it has a scale on here of how far your saw is away from the fence. Let's talk about blade rotation. If we look on here, we see that the blade's rotating this way. We've talked about that already. Now, when we were cutting miter cuts, we were actually feeding, the wood was actually being, the saw was actually being pulled this way into it. And it's just the opposite when you do ripping. The blade's spinning this way but you're gonna be feeding the wood in this way. Let's compare that to, a, to the skill saw. The skill saw, same direction, this way. That, this way. So that's normal, that's not opposite like it was for cross cutting. 
All right, I've repositioned the saw now to put it in the out rep position because it's a little bit easier to see for demo purposes. So let's say we were ripping this sheet of OSB. What I would do is I would position this, I would pos first I would position the blade slightly into the table, about a 32nd of an inch. Then, and that's, you do that with this crank handle down here. Then I would loosen up this clamp screw this guard screw, excuse me, and take the nose of the guard right here and lower it down so it's just about an eighth of an inch or so above the piece that I'm cutting. Then I'll tighten this up to secure that guard in place. And I would take my workpiece, bring it back here, loosen up this wing nut, and lower this little assembly here. This thing is called a anti-kickback curve spreader. All right, I've zoomed in on the anti-kickback curve spreader assembly so you can see that it has those two little pawls on this side and the wheel and then on the other side are two other pawls exactly the same as that. What this wheel does is it's going to go into the kerf that's cut by the saw blade and that's going to keep the kerf spread so it doesn't pinch together. And what these little teeth are going to do is they're going to allow the wood to only slide in one direction. Only the way you're feeding it, not back out again. They're kind of like uh, the tire rippers that you see at parking garages. All right, I put the saw back into the in-rip position. So you can see something a little more clearly. Remember, remember when we set this up for rip cutting, we first adjusted this nose of this guard so it was about an eighth of an inch above this piece of wood. And the reason you want to do that is, like I said before, the blade is spinning up from the table. So when this wood starts in here, it's going to want to lift up like that because the blade's going to be kicking it up. And that, that's what that's for. It stops that from being kicked up. Of course, you're going to be feeding it through and holding it down anyways. But if it does catch, you've got a guard there to keep it from lifting up. The other purpose of this guard, and especially this nose, is to prevent you from putting your hand into the blade. I mean, your hand's going to be over here, or if you're cutting something narrow, you're going to be using a push stick or a push board. But that's a protector to help guard from that. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about the hazards involved with ripping a piece of wood. It's something called kickback, and I've written down what I want to say so I get it right. Kickback is when the saw, under its own accord, ejects the stock from the table. Binding is the cause of kickback. Either the workpiece binds between the fence and the blade, or the blade is bound by a pinching kerf. Both cause the blade to grab the work and propel it suddenly, furiously, and without warning back toward the operator at a very high rate of speed. Saw blades spin at over 100 miles per hour, and as such, they can eject the piece with enough force to drive it through a plaster wall. You wouldn't want to be hit by that missile. Now, I've set the saw up again so you can see this blade cover and it shows me the blades rotating this way. That's the same thing as this little car. The tires are rotating this way. Let's pretend that this wheel on this car is the blade on this saw. And this little piece of paper is the piece of wood that's being fed into the saw to be cut. So let's start up our makeshift radial arm saw here and see what happens when we touch the wheel, which is the same as touching the blade, to our piece of work here. We look at a saw blade, you'll notice that the teeth on this, hard to see I'm sure, the teeth are a little bit wider than the body of the blade itself. And that allows this blade to spin freely when it goes through and cuts the wood and not eject it. However, if anything causes the workpiece 
to touch the back teeth of the blade here as it's coming out, it'll shoot it back. Now that could be caused by this fence being misaligned so that it's pinching the board as it comes in and then it'll hit these teeth, get caught and get kicked out. Or it could be that the blade's misaligned and it gets caught. Or it could be when I'm running it along the fence, the piece I'm cutting, that I push it or skew it a little bit and it catches. Anything that catches it on either side of this blade will eject it. Another thing that will cause the saw to kick wood back is when the kerf, this slit in the board that you've just cut, pinches. And that naturally wants to happen. Your wood's coming out of your saw, and as it comes out, it starts to pinch. And that'll allow the blade to grab it and eject it. And that's what that little kerf spreader is for right here, this wheel, to keep that kerf open. And that's why it's important to always use that. Okay. Also, Make sure that when whatever piece of wood that you're ripping has a completely flat, straight edge that will ride against this completely flat, straight fence. If you have a little cut or something like that, like I have on this one, that'll allow the wood to move away from the fence, allow the blade to grab it, and it'll be kicked back. And also, you don't want your wood to wobble. You want to have a nice flat bottom, too, when you're sliding the wood through. Okay, I have the saw set up here to do a bevel rip with it being in the in-rip position. And notice that that blade guard, or the blade itself, is tilted towards the fence. This saw only rotates in that direction. You can't rotate it the other way to make bevel cuts. So I don't suggest doing a bevel cut from this side because think about this, with that blade being beveled in at the top leaning towards the fence, it's probably a little more likely to pinch the wood between the fence and the blade, which could result, of course, as we know, in a kickback. But let's look at it as we have it in the outrip position. Now I've changed the configuration around so that this saw is now in the outrip position. Of course, I've left the blade beveled, and I'm standing over on this side because you got, I'm trying to remind you that when you have it in the outrip, you got to feed this way against the direction the blade's spinning. But look at that. You've got a V going this way now so that your workpiece can kind of come up if it needs to. It's not going to get trapped down below. So to me, this is a safer way to do beveled ripping. Okay, we mentioned that as you're feeding a piece of wood in to be rip cut, that these front teeth are spinning up and then it wants to lift the piece and so you put this nose guard down to prevent that from happening but as the work is coming out of the saw teeth on this side are pushing down just the exact opposite so if the piece or the blade is to bind and get kicked back the only way this can be bound because it's being pushed the work's being pushed down into the fence the only way this can be kicked back is parallel to the fence. Now on some other circular saws where the blade doesn't cut into the table, the piece can be caught by the blade and flung up and to one of the and to the side. Arm saw, since you know that when kickback happens, it always happens parallel to the fence, when you're cutting, why not position yourself on the non-fence side of the blade like I'm standing here? That way, when the, if the discharge happens for some unseen reason, you're not going to be in line with the missile coming out. Okay, I'm removing this little dust collecting chute so that you can see on this saw there's a label right here and it says danger to avoid injury do not feed material into cutting tool from this end all right now remember we have this tool in the out rip position okay so we've set this up right now to feed our work in from this side if we do a wrong way feed, which is from this side, kind of like you do when you're cross-cutting, and this is what confuses people. 
They cross cut this way, so they take a guess without learning this tool. They take a guess on which way they're going to do a rip cut, and of course they're going to cut it from the same side the handle's on. Manufacturer knew that, and they put a label on there warning you against that. Let's think about what happens when that hap when you feed it in this way. The blade spinning this way, so it's you're pushing your work in the same direction that the blade's spinning. So what's the blade going to do? It's going to grab onto the wood. It's going to pull it this way. It's going to eject it, and it's going to be parallel to the fence. Your hand's going to be on here. It's going to happen suddenly and violently, and it's going to pull your hand right in there. There's no guards on this side. You, can't, you won't have your anti-kickback call set up on this side. The nose of the guard that holds the piece down is over on that side, and that protects your hand from going in. So a wrong way feed, extremely dangerous. Never do it. It happens, and I think that's one of the main reasons people say, I would never rip on a radial arm saw. It's because they don't know what they're doing. They haven't taken the time to learn the tool. They took a guess. They ripped on the wrong side. The piece went in, it shot out like a missile. It scared them to death, and they never want to do it again. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about table configuration. You can rearrange the parts of this table to give you different lengths and widths of cuts. What you've got here is you've got a front table, then you've got a fence, then you've got a spacer, and then you've got a rear table. The front table is attached to the base of the saw down here with some bolts. If I didn't have this table protector on here, you could see the attachment points. The rear table and the fence and the spacer are all just squished up against the front table with a couple of clamps, one on each side. I've got that one loose now. So, in this configuration, which I call the standard configuration, you can do a 13 inch cross cut, straight cross cut. Those lengths are going to change when you put this in the miter position because you're rotating around the radius of a circle. So you'll have, you'll be able to cut narrower boards, although your cut itself might be a little bit longer. So this is also the best and safest setup for cross cutting because the whole blade assembly is behind the fence. However, we can change this around and we can gain a couple of inches of, on our cross cut if let me loosen this up. We move the fence behind the spacer. All right, I have the fence set up behind the spacer. And as I mentioned, that gives us an extra two inches of cross cutting width. Now, this is not the best configuration because, first of all, if you can see here, the blade protrudes from the front of the fence. And that's bad for two reasons. First of all, it's an obvious safety risk, although you'd never have your hands close to that. But the second thing is, it doesn't allow you to cut thick stock because you have to have your piece of wood wash up against the fence before you cross cut it and if that blade's sticking out you can't cut anything thicker than this ruler all right so you'd never set your uh, table up in this arrangement unless you were cutting a piece that was wider than 13 inches so this gap right here between the table protector and the spacer doesn't matter because your piece is going to be at least 13 inches wide and as you cut it, it's not going to be affected by that gap. If you have your fence in the standard position and you set this up in the in-rip position, our scale on here tells us it says front fence position or rear fence position. This tells us right here that we can rip a piece between the saw blade and the fence at about seven inches. I measured it at seven and three eighths. Um, but when we flip this over, 
and have it in the outrip position, according to our scale here and according to my measurements, we can gain 10 inches. Now, there's one other configuration you can use with ripping. You would never use the uh, fence behind the spacer. What you'd use is the fence behind the rear table, like this. And now, in the outrip position, you've got, does it tell us over here? 26 inches. I measured, and you can actually do 26 and an eighth. So you can cut a, a width on a rip of 26 and an eighth. If you spin this around, that takes us down to 16 and an eighth. If you have your table set up in this way, don't put your saw in the cross cut position like I've done here. How are you going to cut like that? You'd have to freehand it. And you never freehand on this saw. In conclusion, I just want to say that yes, the radial arm saw is a very dangerous tool. However, when used with caution and understanding and in the correct alignments and with all the safety features in place, it is a very enjoyable and extremely capable tool. When operating a dangerous tool like this, always have some fear. And remember, if it doesn't feel safe, look safe, or sound safe, it's clearly not safe. When you're doing unfamiliar operations with this, learn how to do them correctly before you do them and mentally rehearse them. Even when you're doing familiar operations, plan them out carefully, take your time, never be in a rush, and keep the tool in proper working order. Remember, the tool provides the muscle, and you provide the thinking. Thanks for watching. The saw that you've seen featured in this video is a 1982 Craftsman 10 inch radial arm saw from Sears. When I bought it, it was 35 years old, but it had never been taken out of the box.